Five Along Crossroads is your show all about nonprofits and the people that make the mission happen. I'm Marjorie Moore, Executive Director of Mind's Eye, and my personal mission is to make nonprofits stronger by identifying and fixing the rubs that so often come up between people and the mission. And we have my fabulous co-host, Natalie Jablonski, the Nonprofit Ninja. Thank you so much. Yep, specializing in helping nonprofits maximize their time, talent, and resources to achieve organizational greatness. Thinking of speaking of fabulous, we have a Good. fabulous guest today. We do. I'm excited. Tell us more about what we're talking about okay. today. So I was reading the Post Dispatch a couple of days ago, yes. and there was this article in nonprofits, which and it wasn't just a like this nonprofit is bad article, which I was very nice <laughs> to see. Um, no, I didn't get beat up in the press. So, yeah, so it was, so it was good news, but in bad news, the article was all about how hard it is to raise money in this economic reality, which yeah. is a term they just really really hate. Yeah. Um. Overall, the article painted like kind of a doom and gloom picture about like the state what? of fundraising. It said that um, total giving nationwide was uh, $373.25 billion. That's okay. Be Yay. I'll, I'll take a piece of that. Yeah, and that was a 4.1 increase over 2014. Fantastic. So, so yeah, that was from giving you a set. Where's the and, doom and gloom part? <laughs> but that nonprofits were still struggling finding donors and finding funding. So we were trying so yeah. what's going on? It happens, right? So, it happens. So that's why we brought in Brett Heinrich. Uh, the uh, president of the local uh, AFP chapter and here in St. Louis to talk to us about what's going on. So welcome, Brett. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Marjorie. Thanks, Natalie. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. You know, it's interesting, the statistics you referenced from Giving USA, what I, the, the positive, the good news uh, that I take from that is that we as a society are a uh, charitable uh, society. Uh, as Americans, we believe in helping those who uh, need help. And ever since those statistics have been gathered, only one time in the history of those statistics have we ever seen a decline. Uh, as you know, uh, the vast majority of giving comes from individuals, mm-hmm. uh, 78% from individual giving, and then another 6 to 8% each year from bequests and planned gifts, which also are from individuals. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I think that speaks to the American spirit, uh, that we as Americans tend to uh, open our hearts, open our wallets to people who need us. And that's something that really excites me. Awesome. Well, we're really glad you're here. And tell us which organization you're with. I work with a, just a fantastic organization named St. Andrew's Resources for Seniors. Uh, in my role, I'm the chief development officer. I run the charitable foundation for St. Andrew's. Uh, we're a large organization. We're ranked 13th uh, among the St. Louis Business Journal's largest nonprofit organizations. We employ uh, over 5,000 individuals across 21 senior living communities, ranging from affordable housing, uh, as they say, HUD 202 affordable housing for low-income seniors, uh, to private pay upscale housing, such as the Willows at Brooking Park, uh, out on 141 next, next to St. Luke's Hospital. Uh, our, what, our founder, Mary Alice Ryan, our, our CEO, president and CEO, who's been with the organization 33 years, wow. uh, has always believed is that our seniors need care. They need a roof over their heads, no matter what their circumstances. Uh, it's interesting, St. Andrews right now, we reach about 8,700 individuals each year, uh, the vast majority being older adults, but also we reach out to their caregivers. What we're seeing, of course, is that this time in history is unprecedented. There are right now in the United States more 65-year-olds alive for the first time in history than there are 16-year-olds. This is a challenge, an opportunity for American society uh, that is here to stay for at least the next 20 years. Uh, between now and the year 2030, there will be 72 million baby boomers turning age 65. Wow. When you think about the implications for the nonprofit sector, for society in general, everything we do will be impacted by this group. Mm-hmm. The way we build homes, sure. the way we market and sell retail goods, the way we care for people, health care is going to change dramatically. So we're really living in a fascinating time uh, and certainly a time of growth and opportunity for organizations like St. Andrews all, all across the country. That's awesome. What a great mission. So, excellent. So let's start with the big question. <laughs> it, we'll, we'll probably spend the whole episode and more trying to figure this out, but 
If well, we could solve it. Well, we'd make so much money. So much. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, donate to charity. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> so why do mm-hmm. some nonprofits seem like they can raise money just hand over fist, like they're just, you know, no big deal? And there's other of us out there really struggling even just to make payroll every week. You know, what What do you think are the, the major differences there that, you know, kind of differentiate, you know, the, uh, one of those really high performers to one that struggles more? Absolutely. I think that's a really great question, Marjorie, and one that's very complex and mm-hmm. probably has a lot of different uh, variables that go into that answer. Nonprofit success, I, I believe, starts with the relationship between the donor and the organization. So many times people, when I mention I'm in fundraising or philanthropy, they say, oh, you're in sales. And I always say, no, I'm not in sales. In fact, uh, I'm about as far from sales as you can get. Uh, sales are transactional. When you walk into uh, uh, Dillard's and purchase a watch, uh, you don't have a relationship with the person you purchase that watch from. That's not the expectation. Uh, in our sector, the nonprofit sector, of course, that's entirely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're based on relationships. We're based on aligning the donors' values and beliefs with the organization's mission. So I don't think we're in sales at all. And I think the organizations that recognize that they really exist, uh, certainly for the constituents they serve, but also to align individuals' passions and beliefs with their mission are the ones that have the best fundamental basis for ser- for service and for success. Mm-hmm. Donors want to help. Uh, as I said, we're a caring, giving organization, but we really have to listen. We have to listen to what their needs are, what their interests are, and how they want to help an organization grow. Being able to tell that story openly, honesty, honestly, with transparency uh, is really critical. Okay. I think there's a lot of factors, too. I agree. It's it's a complex question in itself, because I'm sure when you posed the question, there were listeners out there with the smaller charities that were saying their pen and paper ready to mm-hmm. to take notes, thinking we were going to have all the great answers. And I think there are some obvious things that people can do better, and that's relationship building. But I I think there's also some things that, that we, need to real, we need to realize aren't quick fixes. So uh, we can't just say, oh, we need to have better relationship with our donors. Therefore, we're going to we're going to send more mail. And that's that's <laughs> not quite what we're talking about. We're talking about what I hear you're, you're talking about is authentic relationships, uh, transparent relationships where you really can interact with that donor, not on a one way conversation, not even necessarily maybe on a two way, but a three way conversation between the donor and you and the third being the mission is that. That kind of what, in a nutshell, what you're saying? That is a great way to describe it, Natalie, and I agree completely. You know, there there are all kinds of, as you said, tactics out there, the latest uh, way to raise funding, and that really changes. But what doesn't change is our commitment to our mission and our donors. You know, in uh, in the corporate world, I've worked with just some really fantastic people in corporate giving and some of the frustrations that they feel working with nonprofit organizations is uh, duplication of mission. Um, why should I fund your organization when organizations X, Y, and Z are doing the same thing? What makes you different? What separates you from the pack? And so I think uh, nonprofit organizations, it's very helpful to have a strategic plan to step back and do an environmental scan and say, okay, who are we really serving? Who else is serving that audience? How am I different uh, than this audience, and what opportunities are there to collaborate, uh, to come together, and knowing that uh, two organizations of a similar mission working together can meet the needs of a much larger audience than they could by themselves. Awesome. And what I like about what you said, too, is it's the, who else is serving the audience, not who else is doing what we're doing, because I think that's where I see nonprofits get caught up in and, and kind of catch themselves they look at it from a marketing standpoint, going back to the sales reference of we're the only nonprofit out there that's providing an X service to the Y client. We're the only one. Well, that might be the case. And you can champion that from a marketing standpoint all the way home. Mm-hmm. But what I heard you say is, hey, we're talking about relationships with the Y, with those, you know, the people who qualify in those clients in that Y group. Who else is serving them? Not necessarily by method of X, but by other way, because those are the people who are also going to be competing for the same dollars. And that's where I see nonprofits really get tripped up. 
because they're so focused on differentiating themselves and what makes them different, they forget to see what makes them the same. That's a really good point. You know, in a, in a kind of in a area where we do have a lot of people that are kind of working at the same people, mm-hmm. um, it is really important to pay attention to that and to also, I think you guys are right. The the relationship with the donor at that point is is so important. I've seen a lot of development directors come into an organization, and the first thing they do is say, okay, let's go get the um, the latest newsletter from XYZ organization. That's kind of our, you know, rival friend, you know, frenemy. And let's uh, <laughs> let's get those people in our database and send out a prospecting email to them or mailing to them. And, you know, I don't know if that's the right way to go. Right. Time. So sometimes, but maybe not every time. And I think it's sometimes an easier way to go mm-hmm. because no one likes to feel rejected. No one likes to... Yeah to have that rejection, whether we know it's on a personal level or we know it's not on a personal level. And so it's easy to be a little more passive aggressive and, and to be that one way communication. But going back to about what you had brought up at the very beginning is it's not a one way conversation. It's a two way conversation and nonprofits is really, again, a three way conversation. So linking them with your mission and engaging in that conversation. And that doesn't happen by prospecting email. Now, will it make them more aware well, of course it is, but I believe we started this with not what's going to build awareness for your mm-hmm. organization or what's going to help market your organization, but we're talking about it's all about the money, right? No money, no mission. Yep. So how do we then create those relationships? And I think, you know, that's the big question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of it starts with your executive team. If you have an executive director or president CEO that doesn't believe that they should be involved in fundraising, please have them call me. I will explain why they're wrong. <laughs> uh, you, if, if you expect your development director to have some magic potion to be able to fix everything, you're wrong. Wait, they don't have that? They, they don't. They don't. I'm going to have to get Jason into my office. <laughs> <laughs> and if they tell you they do, uh, they're probably not building relationships, right? Because as much as the organization is about the team, the donor wants to talk to the development officer, obviously, but they also want to know what drives the organization. What's the big purpose? What they want to know, they want to champion a winner. And the development director's responsibility is not to have that relationship, but to connect that relationship. Mm-hmm. And if so, if you're if you are listening and you are a member of that executive team and you're asking yourself, why is it my development director doing X? I'm going to ask you to turn back of the round and say, what have I done to help support my development director in achieving X? Uh, Natalie, and take a little accountability. Absolutely. That is such a great point. I'm sure I'll get really... hate mail from a few people for that. But, <laughs> and you all know who you are. But really, that's really what this is about. Well, I'm really glad you mentioned that. Uh, and, of course, one of the ancient conundrums of the nonprofit sector is how do we engage our boards in fundraising? How do mm-hmm. we engage our leadership team in fundraising? I really like what you said um, because I think, you know, from a board perspective and from an executive perspective, helping our leaders understand that fundraising just isn't making the ask. It's establishing a relationship. It's sending a thank you note. Absolutely. It's uh, inviting people to a, an event. And it's all of those things that help build, as you said, Natalie, that relationship. Uh, and, and frankly, people want and expect to interact with the person who has the vision at the top of the organization. And as our, our Maybe role, not the $25 donor. But if we're talking about the $250,000 donor or perhaps the $25,000 donor, depending on what you consider a big gift in your organization, you're absolutely right. You may be able to get away with building a relationship with your management team, or your directors, or however you know you assign those roles in your organization for some of your uh, smaller annual donors. But when it comes to making strategically significant gifts, they want to talk to someone who's behind the strategic significance. And that's the strategy builder. Those are the people at the top. That's got to have their support. And your your thoughts about the organization uh, are, as far as I'm concerned, right on target in terms of really looking strategically across the organization. But then I would also add that as individuals, we really need to be introspective and look inward uh, as fundraising professionals. You know, the the commonly quoted statistic is that the average duration of a fundraising professional's uh, career with an organization is about 18 months. So, it's so uh, disappointing part, to hear it out loud, but you're so right. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a little bit of a supply and demand uh, situation. You know, we have over 1.6 million nonprofit organizations in the United States with something like 30,000 coming online uh, every year. And so 
good fundraising professionals are in demand. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> uh, but what's, what gives me hope, I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to hold, uh, adjunct professorship at Washington University and at Webster University teaching nonprofit development. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, those programs just didn't exist. We all stumbled into this from some other profession. So it's fascinating to think about the sector in 20 years from now or 30 years from now when all of these people are entering it intentionally, they're entering it with a degree, Uh, what that's going to mean for the professionalism of the sector for people's intentions, uh, and I'm really excited about where this is going. Yeah. What really- I find is interesting, too, is people who will say, well, I'm not good at building relationships. I don't know how to re- – how, how does that work? And, and they almost want a class and a way to do it. But the reality is they know how to do it. It's just it's, – it takes time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it takes you making a decision on am I going to do A or B today, and B is relationship building, and that's time-consuming and A is really important, too, so I'm just going to do A. And the next thing you know, you haven't wrote a thank you note in three weeks, and you haven't made a phone call in two weeks. And you're like, I have to quickly make an ask because I'm going to have a board meeting or we need funding. And so then you you skip all those important relationship building tasks, and you're sitting in front of someone asking them for making a donation, and you just you get disappointed because either they don't give it all, uh, which is, you know, it could happen, or they don't give it the level that you expected. And then you want to know, <laughs> what's wrong with them? Why didn't why didn't they give? <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Right. So. Absolutely. That is such a good point. It, it, oftentimes, folks who aren't comfortable making the ask or being in fundraising will project their fears onto their donors. Mm-hmm. My donors don't want me to ask them in this way, or my donors don't want uh, to be engaged in this type of conversation. So that can be put off in favor of doing A back in the office. Right. Uh, but you have event to be planning. Yay. Right. Right. <laughs> let's you, plan an event. Let's have a party. <laughs> you can plan yourself right out of fundraising you, if you're not careful. Yeah, that's a quote right there to take to the bank and cash it. So one of the stats that the article, because I'm glad you sent that to me because I was able to enjoy it, too. It was noting that only 56 percent, 56 point something, 56 point three, 56.3. That sounds right. Percent uh, of adult. St. Louisans gave at least $25 to a charity a year, and we were at number 18, I think, Mm -hmm. right on that list. So what collectively as an industry should we be doing to get that number up? What what do you think we could be doing? You know, as the leader of AFP, we come together and we talk strategically about our industry. What should other fundraising professionals and those who are in the industry, and that is part of their role and responsibility, be doing to really empower each other? Well, that's a great question, and I, I'll just clarify. Right now with the St. Louis chapter of AFP, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, I have the best job on the board because I'm immediate past president. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Laura Rossman is doing a great job. She's our current president. But what I have seen in, uh, through my service with the St. Louis chapter of AFP, and I'm now uh, on the International Board of Directors for AFP, is – the continual need to pull together, to be transparent, uh, to encourage donors about where their gift is going. Uh, you know, we're shifting a little bit in donor attitudes, and I do believe that is generational, uh, both for donors and volunteers. Uh, volunteers used to identify themselves with one organization, and they were altruistic, and they would stay with that organization for years um, because they had um, brand loyalty to that organization. They would mm-hmm. fold and stuff envelopes and whatever <laughs> whatever they needed to do, and they would continue to donate year in and year out and then leave that organization in their in their gift planning. Today's volunteers are different, not better, not worse, but different. Uh, you know, a great example is the international organization called Charity Water that promotes fresh water in third world countries. Uh, donors now can make a gift online and immediately stream through Charity Water's website and see in real time the well that's being dug with their gift uh, in in a third world country. And there's that expectation. Volunteers are more interested in episodic volunteering. They're not interested in long-term volunteering. They want to come out and do a great job, have a clear beginning, middle, and end, and see the outcomes right away. Uh, more and more in our, our pro, uh, f- 
funding requests and proposals to private foundations and corporate foundations, measurable outcomes are the buzzword. You mm-hmm. know, what, how, how will you use not my donation, but my investment? Mm-hmm. Funders are becoming investors, not just charitable donors. And so this is really important for the nonprofit sector to begin to understand, okay, I, I have to begin to think this way as well if I'm going to work in partnership with my donors with uh, funding agencies. Uh, I always have a fear of kind of that, uh, particularly the episodic volunteer, because when we talk about relationships, I feel like it's really hard to build a relationship with somebody who's in the organization for a day and then is really gone, you know, even trying to rebuild them to get them to come back that next time. Um, I think it's really difficult for nonprofits. Um, I know in my organization, we ha- we really struggle with that. Um, we really struggle finding finding projects that can be, effectively done mm-hmm. in one day we can we can make stuff up but to really make an outcome i think that's really difficult what would you say to an organization kind of struggling with those things like ours you know it, i like the fact marjorie that what you talked about was meaningful projects meaningful ways to engage donors uh, because that's what they they really want to know and telling them how their donation is going to be used, Mm -hmm. uh, reporting back after the fact about how they change people's lives. One of the best uh, examples I ever saw of that, I was presenting at a conference in Melbourne, Australia, and I attended a session on on direct mail. And the Humane Society of Melbourne had sent out their direct mail appeal, and it was a a lineup of dogs that were dirty and and uncared for, and it named each dog and said Sally was found uh, in a dumpster two months ago and, and so forth. Then when the donor made their gift, they got a letter back, and across the masthead were, were all the dogs cleaned up and with their new owners, and it said, you know, because of you, we place dogs all across Australia just like Sally, who now lives with Natalie and uh, has a great life. And so don't, don't let me adopt another dog. My husband will be furious. <laughs> Marjorie can have him. <laughs> I can't take another one. <laughs> but, I, but I definitely yeah. get where you're going. It's a yeah. transparency. And I think that's the shift you talked about between making a donation and making an investment. If you think about it, if you had your money and you gave it to your financial advisor and you said, here's some money. Oh, no, I trust you. I'm sure that everything will be great. And when I retire, I'll have a beautiful nest egg. It'd be ridiculous. Everyone would laugh at you, right? You're laughing now. So think about the same way as your donors. If they're not doing that anymore and they're not saying, here's my donation, good luck with that. They're saying, here's my investment. That raises a different level of expectations. They're going to ask you, how are you using it? What are your expenses like? What are your outcomes look like? They're going to be asking those questions, and they want to see those outcomes because they want to know their investment is good. They want to champion a winner. Absolutely. And to that point, championing a winner, I couldn't agree more. You know, sometimes fundraisers will say, well, will people want to uh, support us if they see all the other supporters we have? Yes, absolutely they do. Sure. Because people want, don't, they want to know that they're not the only one investing in this, and mm-hmm. they want to know that they're championing, as you said, Natalie, championing a winner. Yeah, yeah. I always to encourage people who like to give anonymously, and I appreciate why they do. Uh, so it, it happens when we've all been there where you see a list and you're like, ooh, that person donates to them. And we mm-hmm. serve people like that. So we should try to prospect. <laughs> I mean, it's we use the other donors list to prospect. It's mm-hmm. It happens. But I know a lot of individuals uh, who like to give anonymously. And I always encourage them, instead of just saying, I'd like to give anonymously, give under something, another name, another identifier, so that somewhere along the line, someone who's paying attention will say, oh, the Smith family, even it's generic. I see the Smith family a lot in those things like that. They champion good organizations. But it, mm-hmm. it helps the organization you're supporting, not just with the finances, but also with that donor credibility. So oh, that's a great it's, point. it's one thing to have the words anonymous and to respect that. But if they could take on some sort of pseudo name for donations, it really does help to, to build that donor credibility for the organization. It's like a double gift. And, you know, in St. Louis, that is so important. Uh, in Throughout the region, we're a pretty small region. We're a big, small town. Everyone mm-hmm. uh, has a has a shared passion about philanthropy. We are a very philanthropic community, as you said, Marjorie. And knowing uh, who is supporting uh, the various causes in our organization is something that we all like to mm-hmm. know. 
uh, not out of a selfish way, but just because we're a family here. Mm-hmm. And the donors know the gift officers, and the gift officers know the donors, and we uh, we tend to be a big family. I agree. And yeah. I think, uh, you know, when you're talking about the St. Louis metropolitan area specifically for our donors, I know the, the metropolitan area is the part that on the Metro East side, we're mm-hmm. always like, oh, those, you know, big organizations in St. Louis, <laughs> those big organizations are also in Illinois mm-hmm. and there's little organizations in St. Louis. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of the fundamental principles that we've been talking about tonight really fit any organization. You know, it's easy to sort of fall into that mindset of, well, I don't look like that organization. I have a a $500,000 budget instead of a $10 million budget. I'm not uh, one of the big pillars in the St. Louis community, but donors are donors, and every donor deserves your respect, your trust, your transparency, no matter what size of organization you are. And your time. And your time. Yeah. I think it's a challenge for small organizations to make those jumps, Mm -hmm. but time is the one thing we all we, it's, we're all short on we but we all have one of life's yeah. most precious resources yeah, yeah absolutely well thank you so much for coming brett today the thing that we always ask all of our development guests to do is not only if you can give out three names and addresses of your best donors for our for everybody to go ahead and <laughs> give a call to. who also might be, have an interest in our organization <laughs> yeah. some of our listeners organizations <laughs> But if you're not comfortable with that, are there other something else? Maybe you... something else. If, please tell us about some upcoming AFP events and some upcoming uh, St. Andrews events that you have coming on. Absolutely. And let me mention AFP in the broader vein of what that organization has meant to so many people. Please do. Uh, AFP advances philanthropy by enabling people and organizations to practice ethical and effective fundraising, which for me is the bedrock of everything we do. Much more important than the latest tactic to raise funds. AFP is in is an international organization with chapters in Egypt, uh, the United States, Canada, Brazil, Puerto Rico, all with the mission of lifting the profession by helping fundraisers become better at their job. Um, we have uh, over 33,000 members internationally. When I started in fundraising, as we talked about earlier, I – I had no idea what I was doing, and AFP was my lifeline. And so I would encourage particularly young fundraisers uh, who are listening tonight or anyone in the nonprofit sector to get involved. Get involved with AFP. Get involved with other associations like AFP if you're more of a specialist. Get involved with the Plan Giving Council. Uh, Get involved with the Research Council. Um, By becoming a student of the profession, you're really going to elevate what you can do to serve donors. And that's so important. You know, I've been blessed to work with some great organizations uh, throughout my career. And the one I'm with now, St. Andrew's Charitable Foundation, we're particularly excited about the Ageless Remarkable St. Louisans Gala that will be coming up October 23rd at 5 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency by the Arch. This is a tremendous uh, celebration of redefining what it means to uh, be in your retirement years. Uh, We'll be honoring 18 fantastic individuals who are all age 75 plus who continue to lead remarkable lives, either through volunteerism, philanthropy, a second career, a continuing career. And it really is a night uh, that touches the heart uh, like no other and helps us really begin to wrestle with this larger uh, population of aging and understanding where we're going as a society and that life isn't over when you retire. Life really just begins. So I would encourage people to visit our website, St. Andrews, the Roman numeral, or excuse me, the number one dot com. That's St. Andrews one dot com for information about the organization to register for the gala that uh, is on October 23rd and become involved with the largest growing segment of our society. It's a great event. I can tell you just from experience, I've been at the event. It's remarkable as is the name and Regardless of who you serve or the population you serve or the mission you serve, we all are going to get older at some point, and it's great to be able to walk away and say, wow, look at look at what my next half of my life or my next phase of my life could be. Uh, it's definitely inspirational. So kudos to you and your team for that event. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much again for joining us, Brett, and thank you to all of you for joining us on 501 Crossroads. 
We're recording at the Studios of Mind's Eye Radio, and it's pre- produced and hosted by me, Marjorie Moore. And me, Natalie Jablonski. And Mike Curtis is our sound engineer. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher or whatever your favorite app is, and please subscribe to us so you get us every week and leave us some feedback so that maybe they tell other people about us, which would be fantastic. Um, you can find us on Facebook at 501 Crossroads. Thank you for listening, and remember, we're all working towards the same.